about some of the history and some of the things that have happened recently that's pretty exciting for him. He still works at this all the time. I asked him at lunch if he was, uh, if he still did it all the time. He said, yes, he did. <laughs> so, um, Professor Drake is well known to any of us who follow wireless or radio and is a delight to have him here. Dr. Drake has for more than 50 years been the pioneer and advocate of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, with the first recorded search at 1420 megahertz back in 1960. I was still building two radios then. He is a Cornell trained engineer and a Harvard trained astronomer and has been a chaired professor at Cornell, the dean at U University of California, Santa Cruz, president and chair of the SETI Institute as well as a director of the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. He has also been a key designer and champion of the radio telescope antenna innovation, including the twice upgraded Arecibo dish and the Allen Telescope Array, which I believe is in Australia, aspects of which are now part of the square kilometer array. I'm not sure what that is, but I'm, I'm sure he's going to tell us. Tonight, uh, uh, today, rather, the RCA takes great pride in presenting um, him with a Lifetime Achievement Award at the banquet we're going to have tonight. And I hope you can all join us for that if you've bought banquet tickets. But right now, he's going to report to us on his SETI project. And for that, I present um, Professor Drake. Well, thank you for that kind invitation, and it's really a delight to talk to this group of people because you're all like me. <laughs> you love radio, you know a lot about it, and you know that uh, it's going to play, as it has in the past, a very important part in our future forever. And in particular, we're talking about a subject that's not only of great interest to you, but to actually to all knowledgeable human beings all learned human beings, and that is, what can we do about answering one of the great questions? Are we alone? Are there other intelligent creatures in the universe? It's a question that was first raised when we f first recognized that the sun was just a star like all the other stars, and that suggested hundreds of years ago that there might be planets like the Earth, in populated by creatures like ourselves, including those <clears throat> using technology. And we have wondered about that and what they might be like, what we might learn, which would be beneficial to us, but what we might learn about their philosophies, their, their histories, in, information which would be fascinating just in its own right, but also would give us guidance. Now, over the years, people have thought about how can we learn about the extraterrestrials and uh, the answer, as it was about 60 years ago, was that perhaps the best thing we could search for was their radio signals. Uh, any kind of uh, calculation as to what might be discoverable, discoverable in the form of technology always led you to radio astronomies, ra <clears throat> radio signals as the most promising avenue to discovering those other civilizations. Now, that answer came back, it started before the year 1900. Some of the oldest uh, practitioners of radio technology actually had that same idea. Maybe we should search for their radio signals. And in fact, <clears throat> the search I did in 1960 was not the first. It was the first which was sound scientifically. Those that had gone before by well-known people such as Marconi, Guglielmo Marconi, searched for extraterrestrial intelligence. Also Nikola Tesla searched for extraterrestrial radio signals. And in both cases, they actually sent signals to space. But these searches could never have worked. They didn't know that. They didn't, couldn't have worked because the radio frequencies they used, which were in the <coughs> low megahertz, do not penetrate the ionosphere of the Earth. And they did not know there was an ionosphere. 
So there was no way signals at, uh, at uh, high frequencies, as we call them, could have penetrated to the surface for them to detect, nor could the signals they sent ever escape the Earth for others to detect. The first time we had the ability to detect reasonable signals across the interstellar distances at frequencies that penetrate the ionosphere <clears throat> was in the late 1950s, when I was a young student and being fascinated by this subject made calculations as to how far away could a radio transmitter typical of our civilization at that time be detected by technology, radio telescopes of that time. And I found that for the first time, the combination of our best radio receivers and the radio telescopes then being built could detect signals typical of our civilization across the distances to the nearest stars. Of course, today we can do much farther than that. We have telescopes, which I'm going to show you in a minute, which can detect signals that we are transmitting across distances all the way to the far side of the galaxy, to the far side of the Milky Way, 100,000 light years away. So <clears throat> back in the late 1950s, when this became possible, we first started projects of this type. And <clears throat> The first one was the one I carried out in 1960 called Project Ozma. It was done at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Green Bank, West Virginia. And uh, this was the telescope we used. It was considered a very large telescope at the time. It's a 25-meter, 85-foot radio telescope uh, at, at Green Bank, West Virginia. And the people you see there are the people who participated in that experiment. Uh, not as they were at the time, but uh, when we had a reunion some years later. This telescope searched for signals from the two nearest stars to the Earth, like the Sun, uh, both about 10 light years away, and found nothing. Well, what was the receiver like that we used? <coughs> this is it. And this is a test to find out which of you are really old-time amateurs. We, <laughs> you'll see some familiar things here. Of course, you won't be able to see that this is all vacuum tubes. There's not a transistor that doesn't exist yet. But this is what we used. And uh, if uh, you're very clever and have a good history, go back to the 1960s, you may recognize the data recorder that's in the lower right there. Uh, oops, I pushed the wrong button here. Uh, This? What is it? Wollen sack. It's a Wollen sack tape recorder. There we are. There we, we were being optimistic. We were assuming maybe we we're going to hear people talking, so we better be <laughs> better be ready to record them. So that's why the Wollen sack recorder was there, with the switches turned on, ready to, to record the great discovery. Some of you may recognize this object. Who is it? What is it? What's the maker? Hammerlund, right. It's a ham Hammerlund radio receiver. It's a, it's a ham receiver. Uh, good old ham receiver, which was used as part of the equipment because it was easy to tune. And so what we had was a telescope, which accepted a wide range of radio frequencies. And then we picked out radio frequencies to watch for signals using the Hammerlund receiver. So these were key aspects of this whole installation, which was all vacuum tubes and cost oh, a total of $2,000. And we did the first search, and it was just possible at that time that the sky was full of signals and we would succeed in the first few minutes. But that didn't happen. And what we've learned in recent years is that the search is going to be very long and difficult. Many, many frequencies to be observed, tested for signals. Many, many places in the sky, different stars where signals might be coming from. And so we have learned, the lesson we have learned is that uh, it's going to take a great deal of searching <clears throat> of many objects and many frequencies. Well, over the years, people have tried as best they could. And the story of SETI over this last 50-year history is that uh, it's always been in sort of a, a, a profession which is dominated by paupers. We don't have our own telescopes. We have to be guest observers on telescopes, get a little time here and there. Or we use telescopes that are obsolete and have been abandoned, in which we adapt to doing SETI. Uh, 
for instance, this one, which was used for many years at Harvard. Uh, this is the one I did my PhD thesis on, by the way. It's, it was then a 60-foot radio telescope. It had some out, out, outer uh, segments added to it later to become an 84-foot radio telescope. This is at the <coughs> Harvard Observatory at Harvard, Massachusetts, which is a town. Most people don't know that. And it's tilted not because it's broken, but because that this telescope had been designed for use at a different latitude. But uh, when we bought it at Harvard, uh, they didn't want to go to the bother of redesigning it, so they just brought us one. And we had to tilt it so it thought it was at a different latitude. And in that way, <laughs> it worked right. Uh, and <coughs> there's a person here to give you scale. It was pretty big. And this one was actually used for years to uh, do a crude survey of the whole sky at the prime frequency always used by radio astronomers, which is that associated with the hydrogen atom, 1420 megahertz. Well, as the years went on, <coughs> uh, men, there were about 100 Ch SETI projects around the world. The Russians were big for a while. Uh, the Italians, the Australians have played a major role. The French, they've all been in the game, and, but mostly the Americans. And they used all different telescopes, but normally as guest observers. Uh, so they got not much time, and they perhaps couldn't even point the telescope in the direction they wanted to point it. But they tried and made the best they could do. Uh, some of them, such as the people at Berkeley, were very clever and invented SETI at home, which I think probably many of you know about, where they take the uh, signal that's being detected by the radio astronomer and search it for signals separately by sending packets of information to people at home where they, with their personal computers, can actually search th the data for the presence of intelligence signals. And that's still going on today. There are millions of users doing this, and it's very clever and, of course, totally efficient. No special uh, equipment time or anything ne being necessary. The epitome of where we got in this business is this telescope, which came into existence 50 years ago. This is a 50-year-old telescope. It's the Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico. It's still the benchmark for the ultimate in sensitive radio telescopes to this day, 50 years later. It's still the largest telescope in the world. Uh, it won't be for long, and I'm going to show you what's going to replace it soon. But uh, this is it. It's got a reflector which is 1,000 feet in diameter. And just to give you a feel for it, uh, by the way, how many of you have visited it? That's not enough. This is one of the m most uh, spectacular places you can visit. It's really out of this world once you get there. Uh, just to give you scale, this is 1,000 feet across. The total collecting area is 15 acres. Notice there's a little, there's a hole in the bottom of the dish. I'm going to show you that up close soon. Uh, that hole in size is equal to the combined collecting area of all the big optical telescopes on Earth, just to give you a feel. These towers all stand 10 feet taller than the Washington Monument compared to the bottom of the dish. And this structure in the middle, which may look small, is actually 100 meters in size. And, <clears throat> and weighs uh, more than 10, 100 tons. It's 100 tons. Uh, and it, it, we'll see it better in a minute, but uh, it moves so as to allow the telescope to search different parts of the, the sky. Uh, <clears throat> this is what the surface looks like close up. It consists of 38,778 surface panels, each about the size of a dining room table. I think you can sense where they are here. All, as you know, if you look carefully, are actually slightly curved so that they fit the spherical contour which the surface needs if it's to be a telescope which very precisely adds radio signals together in synchronism to give us maximum gain. There's some two workmen on the surface. Notice they're wearing special shoes like snowshoes so they can walk on the surface without bending it. The surface consists of perforated aluminum sheets. Uh, and as I said, there are just a very large number of them, all set in place, by the way, to an accuracy of a little more than one millimeter. Now, what you need f to focus any radio wavelength accurately, and I think you all know this, is a, pre a precision in the antenna, which is a small fraction of the wavelength, typically a 20th or a 40th of a wavelength. So with, <coughs> with a 
one and a half uh, millimeter accuracy, this telescope can work at X band, which it does. That's its limit. Uh, <coughs> here it is, different view to give you a feel for the, what the 15 acres are like. Uh, you'll see on the dish there are these white spots on each panel, and these are targets for surveying instruments which are used to place the panels in place. It takes weeks to adjust the surface, tune it up, where, where six theodolites arrayed around the edge of the dish and one in the middle sight on these point targets and then the data is served to a computer and an algorithm uh, calculates where the position of, the of the, this point is and tells us how to adjust it so as to make the surface to, as accurate as it should be. And there are places underneath the surface you can't see here where workmen ride on little trolleys with wrenches and actually turn screws to adjust things into place. This allows the telescope to work to about eight gigahertz in frequency. Now, <clears throat> that is the best dish we have today, and it and others have been used, as I've told you, to, in hundreds of experiments without finding anything. And often we are asked, well, why don't you give up? You've tried and it's not there. Well, there is a very good and sound answer to that, and, as, and that is that although we have tried a lot, it's easy to calculate that it's not been enough. Any reasonable, plausible calculation of how many civilizations might be out there tell us that uh, there are perhaps a million or so, but there are 100 billion stars in the galaxy. And so it works out that the perhaps one in a million stars might have a planet that's transmitting a, a signal. How long do they transmit? Well, they don't uh, do it for long. So you can calculate that uh, you may have to search a million stars before you will hit upon a signal. That's the challenge. And not only that, you don't know what f frequency channel they will be using. Now we, we try to solve that problem, and I hope without being over-optimistic or unrealistic, by assuming that the extraterrestrials are as smart as we are. <laughs> and uh, they will know that certain frequency bands are more appropriate and, and uh, uh, promising to, to search for signals. There are limitations to the, the sensitivity of radio telescopes at various frequency bands created by nature, not by technology, but by nature. At very low frequencies, the galaxy is very noisy due to orbiting electrons and the magnetic fields of the galaxy. At the higher frequencies, the quantum nature of light causes the signals to be noisy. There is a band in between, which we call a water hole, where you can communicate across interstellar space with the least energy and best signal to noise in a radio, or in, in whatever telescope is appropriate. Uh, and that is what we call the water hole, and it's the band from about one gigahertz to 10 gigahertz. We know that, the extraterrestrials will know that, and we can just hope that they're exploiting that band for their loud communications with whatever, their spacecraft, their space colonies, something we can detect. We, we use that in our communications with spacecraft, what NASA used, they're all using frequencies in the water hole. And so we search in the water hole, and this is why radio is most promising. Every other frequency, light, infrared, x-rays, all have some natural barrier. It's only here in this window, one to eight, one to 10 gigahertz, <coughs> that space is transparent, and you can see all the way to the far side of the galaxy without in <coughs> a problem. So, <coughs> uh, we, we know that this is the thing to do, but our problem over the years is access to instruments to do the searching. You need a lot of observing time. You need to look at a lot of frequency bands. And the frequency bands could be very narrow. As you all know, the more narrow the, the bandwidth is, the stronger the signals are if you've got a, cer a certain transmitter power. And so it's just feasible, and, and in fact, perhaps likely the, the extraterrestrials are, will transmit with a one hertz bandwidth, much smaller than we normally use in our communications. Why? Because the signals will be detectable at a much greater distance. And after all, there's no big hurry. You can send with one hertz bandwidth, you can only send one bit a second, which isn't a lot, but uh, 
since the, the signal is going to take perhaps thousands of years to get where it's going, you, you don't care if it takes a month or so to send the signal. So we think it's wise to be able to search for signals with bandwidth as little as one hertz. Well, how many signals are there in, say, eight gigahertz? Well, there's eight giga signals. <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, that's about 10 to the 10th frequency channels. So if you wanted to search the whole spectrum, you needed a receiver that can search 10 to the 10th channels. Uh, we actually know how to build that, but it's very expensive. <laughs> and there's a little problem getting a, a, a collecting antenna that can be that broadband, as you know. Uh, but this has become our goal. We've now realized to be realistic and mount a comprehensive search that really tests all the possibilities we're going to have to look at millions of stars, and we must look at billions of frequency channels. That's the real challenge and what we have to do if there's to be a real hope to succeed. What we've been playing in the, doing in the past is playing a lottery where we held a ticket, but the winning tickets were very, very rare. We want to have, be playing a lottery where we own all the tickets, and that's our game for the future. Well, this was all <clears throat> um, um, uh, knowledge we knew, but could do nothing about until recently, when only a few months ago, a very successful entrepreneur here in Silicon Valley with some of his friends established a nonprofit corporation called the Breakthrough Foundation. This is sponsored by Yuri Miller, Milner, uh, Sergey Brin of um, Google, uh, from the Google company, and uh, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, along with some other people, who have put millions of dollars into this for a breakthrough foundation, first to give prizes to scientists uh, in, in, the, in the style and, and pattern of the Nobel Prizes, but now, in, just in the last few months, they're putting money into creating what it will take to do that grand search I just described to you. And what they have done is to commit $100 million, which just boggles our mind, to, to finance a search will, which will deal with those big numbers I just told you about a minute ago. And the idea here is to make use of a situation which is new and in a way bad, but for SETI, good. And that is that funding to support the operation of existing radio telescopes has become cut dramatically by in the uh, governmental support groups all across the globe, particularly in the United States. And they are being forced to divest themselves of some of their radio telescopes. And the choice they are ex uh, accept, uh, uh, accepting is turn off the old ones. Well, one of the old ones is Arecibo, for example. And so it has been threatened with closure, and they have recently sent out a letter, and this is no secret, inviting people like me and others to find somebody who will fund the continued operation of the telescope. Otherwise, they will call it just junk it, which is just a horrible thought. Well, the Breakthrough Foundation learned of this and decided, well, we'll step in and take care of this. And so they are committing to supporting the operation of the largest telescopes that are threatened in this way. One of them is the Arecibo telescope. This is that suspended platform. I meant to tell you more about this. Uh, this, uh, this is 100 meters long. It's the size of the next largest telescope. It has this dome, which has in it a 60-foot radio telescope, which acts with a third mirror to uh, correct the uh, spherical aberration created by the spherical shape of the reflector. This is a 96th long line feed, as it's called, which is used for radar experiments. It's a very complex, uh, ingenious circular waveguide with slots, uh, which weighs about 10,000 pounds and is used for radar experiments. This one has the ability to very uh, successfully concentrate and capture uh, signals through the whole microwave window, the water hole, as I mentioned to you, 
This one's used primarily for radar measurements of the positions of asteroids and studies of the ionosphere. This is one of the telescopes then. This one, this old one, which we have, are trying to get use of and to arrange. And uh, I can't say we have yet, so I can't say Breakthrough is really going to use this one, although everybody expects it to. It's just paperwork that's involved at this point. Uh, the NSF is willing to have it used, but there, there's just uh, some legal things that have to be decided before this becomes part of the break, Breakthrough Listen project, which is the name for the project in which these large old telescopes are used in SETI. Another one which is already contracted, this is the largest steerable, fully steerable telescope in the world, 100 meter telescope at Green Bank, West Virginia, where all this started. The original telescope I showed you is just a few hundred yards from this. This one has a, <coughs> a surface of 100, it's 100 meters in diameter. It's a, <coughs> oops. It, it's a Gregorian, uses a Gregorian configuration, which may be new to you. This is a parabolic dish, which is focusing radiation up here. And up here, this tiny thing is a second reflector. It may look tiny, but it's about 20 feet in diameter. And it turns the rays around and focuses them to a focal point right here where there are uh, standard microwave horns and front ends to capture the radiation. This is a good design because it is an unobstructed aperture. This is a clear aperture and with nothing in front of the radiation to scatter radiation, and in particular to scatter radio frequency interference into the dish, which is a problem. This one has an extremely good system noise temperature, about 16 degrees. It has maser amplifiers on it, and Breakthrough Foundation has a contract to use this 20% of the time. Uh, this gives you a f f sense for the size of it. It's almost as tall as the Washington Monument. This is a fantastic structure. And if you're ever in West Virginia, you can find your way to this place. It's quite, it's quite a shock to go around a bend in a country road and see this thing standing. Another one we've contracted with <coughs> is the largest telescope in the Southern Hemisphere, where, which is the prime place to search for signals from much of the Milky Way as the center of the galaxy come, goes overhead at this telescope. Uh, this is a 64-meter, 210-foot telescope at Parkes in Australia. It's an old, old telescope. It was actually used to, c to capture the transmission of the video of humans putting their first steps on the moon. The NASA telescopes that were supposed to do this were broken, and they turned to this one to bring the signal down. Some of you may have even seen the movie. It's called The Dish, which uh, describes that event. This is another view of it. It's a very good telescope. It has a multi-beam capability. It can look at about 11 directions at once. And so this is a challenge to us in creating instrumentation to put on it. Uh, but that is underway. And in fact, the construction for these two telescopes I've mentioned as contracted for is already underway. And the first observations are to be made at Green Bank on January 1st. That's a little over a month from now. So <clears throat> what else is in the future? I've just told you what is already contracted for, but we were already thinking ahead to other telescopes which are now cordial to uh, conducting SETI experiments. This is artwork showing a telescope that's being part of a project called the Square Kilometer Array. Uh, and this is a part of it that's going to be based in Western Australia. 64 dishes, each one of them is uh, uh, 15 meters across, about 45 feet. This is an artist's conception. Here's a picture of an actual dish, not quite like the ones you just saw. Again, it's a, here's a, per, oops. It's a person here. Okay. Just to give you scale, each one of these is 15 meters across. And again, it's a Gregorian uh, telescope where the the power is reflected off this dish onto this dish, which, is, which is, then reflects the power into this, these microwave horns. Notice they're on a turret. You can turn it to receive whatever frequency you want to receive. Uh, there is a dish, uh, a, a array of these being constructed in Western Australia called the Meerkat. 
And for those of you who are, know about animals, meerkats are these cute little animals that poke their heads out of the ground in the southern hemisphere, and that's what it's named for. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, and uh, we were already talking to them about putting some of our equipment on that, uh, oh, that system when it is constructed. Its total collecting area is to be based on having 64 dishes like the one you just saw, which would give it the same sensitivity as the Green Bank Telescope. Now another one that's under construction and which we've actually been invited to participate on, much to our surprise, is a super major project in China. China has decided to, to become a science power, I think as many of you know, and it's one of their ways of becoming a science power, they decided they want to build the largest radio telescope in the world. And this is a picture of the concept of that telescope. And it may look kind of familiar to you because it's essentially a copy of the Arecibo telescope. And that's what they're doing. They're copying our, our technology. It's got a big spherical bowl. It's got towers. Instead of three, it has six and a system here in the middle which moves around because the, in this case the uh, cables are going to move to allow the telescope to lift different parts of the sky. It even has uh, this ground screen which uh, prevents heat radiation from the ground from getting into the receivers and causing more noise. Now this is a project which I thought would take many years to construct. Uh, they actually broke ground for it about seven years ago in a very isolated part of China, which exa looks exactly like the region where Arecibo is. It's karst tabak, tabak topography with bi big basins carved out by f flowing water and limestone. And uh, surprisingly, they are making great progress despite the fact this is in a wilderness. They, they really have wildernesses in China. and. <clears throat> and uh, it, it is getting built very quickly. This is a close-up of the actual thing. Here are working, uh, preparing a surface panel for uh, mounting on the telescope. The, these pan they're using triangular panels. We used rectangular panels on Arecibo. These are each 15 meters in size, and there will be 4,000 of them on the telescope. The name of the telescope is FAST, F-A-S-T, which is short for, strangely, in English, it's got an English name, the 500 meter astronomical spherical telescope. It's to be 500 meters in diameter in, in contrast to Arecibo's 300 meters. So more than twice as big in collecting area, making it the world's largest telescope. Now they, like Arecibo, will not ever use the whole surface at once. At Arecibo, we actually only use 220 meters at the same time. This is to avoid problems of picking up ground radiation and vignetting, as it's called, cutting off of the uh, observing pattern. pattern. Uh, they're going to use 300 meters, so actually uh, about twice as big a, a, <coughs> a collecting area as at Arecibo. On the other hand, the, the uh, wavelength limitation on this, or frequency limitation, is that the maximum frequency is three gigahertz, whereas at Arecibo it's eight gigahertz. So most of the water hole will be accessible only to Arecibo, and it will still be the largest telescope in the world, uh, as far as SETI is concerned. So this is a close up, this is an actual picture of it as of a few months ago. It's an incredible structure that they've done. And all of this has been done in about a year. Uh, <clears throat> and you notice this, this is the ring which is going to hold the surface and it has to be elevated above the ground which greatly increased the cost of this. And that's because the hole in the ground they had found in China isn't deep enough. So they have to sort of suspend the surface in the air and that means they have to have all these structures which are each, each one is uh, several hundred feet high and they're all around the dish. Uh, here's a more recent picture of the progress. You can see how much uh, has been built in almost no time. Uh, these towers, if you, I don't know how tall they are. I could not find that in the literature, but if you try to compare this, this size to 500 meters, they look to be about 150 meters high, so like 450 feet high. 
every one of them, which is shocking. Uh, <clears throat> plus, they're all standing on these towers here, which are probably 100 feet high each. Uh, you see a bunch of specks down here. I, I don't know what these are. I think they're also the, uh, plat the uh, platforms on which they put the theodolites to set the surface. They, they've copied everything from Arecibo except the number of towers and the way in which the uh, focal point has b being moved. So this is progress, and this is the last slide here is what it looked like. This is from 10 days ago, a photo of it from 10 days ago, which was published on the web. And you can see they do have surface panels in place down in the bottom here, this much. And it's proceeding. And they are expecting to go into operation in the year 2016. And we'll see if that happens. And I think when they do, they're going to find it's quite difficult to move the uh, apparatus in the center around properly, and also to make the surface conform to a parabola, which is what they're going to do. They're going to have actuators on every panel so that they can, under computer control, deflect uh, or distort the surface so it duplicates a parabola rather than a sphere for the part of the sky they're looking at. And that's a good idea, but it's going to be very challenging technically and operationally. So, surprisingly enough, they've invited us to join and provide some SETI equipment to use on this telescope. We question whether the technology transfer will be legal. Uh, but, of course, we'd be glad to be partners with this because Americans have been doing this project for 50 years. We don't want to be, want to be left out when it actually succeeds. And that's the situation with Breakthrough. Thank you. Thank you. So, so we're going to allow at least uh, 10 minutes for questions. Um, we'll run a little late, and then we'll make up for it in the next break. <clears throat> so those of you that have a question for Professor Drake, please raise your hand, and, and we'll, we'll race around with this. It's not as much as a question as a statement. Uh, the AWRL Puerto Rico Convention that's held in January, one part of that is Thursday, we take a tour of Arecibo. And for those of you that are looking for a sunny time in January, it's a great time to go down there and you get a, a tour of it. Uh, Angel, who's the, the head of the operation of the um, radio telescope is a ham and he'll answer any questions that you have. Yeah, so that's a good place to visit and any time of year it's about the same. The temperature's the same, it rains every day just the same. And, uh, I've got a question. question. Yeah. Uh, in, 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 your, in your search for um, uh, intelligence, what kind of information do you expect to receive? Um, the, 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 someone's name, um, a, a, a digital information, analog information, uh, pictures of the other planet. Exactly well, what do you have in mind? You're asking us to do something we have asked ourselves over and over and we realize it's difficult, and that is to psych out the extraterrestrials. What are they going to be doing? Do they do frequency shift keying? <laughs> do they do FM? Do they AM? Uh, what do they do? And so what we're doing is preparing for everything, and we're constructing algorithms. You know, I didn't have time to mention one of our biggest problems is not just having a big telescope and a lot of time, but it's handling the data that comes in. You need algorithms to search through that data for a great variety of signal forms, such as you mentioned. And that is very challenging, particularly when you've got, as we are going to have a minimum of a gigahertz of bandwidth at any given time, which is a billion channels, you got to search through all billion for various signal forms, and uh, it's, it can be done. It's going to take a lot of programming, and that, that is in progress, too. But we're not assuming anything. We're trying to do it in such a way that you can find a signal no matter what its form is. There's some things you can do, uh, such as uh, cross-correlation of uh, 
data streams to detect that there is a signal there without revealing what it is. But that will tell us where we should dig deeper to find out what the signal is. And so that will be part of the game. We will play games like uh, uh, correlating a signal taken at one time with one taken at another time from the same place and frequency in the, in the radio spectrum. And uh, in that cross-correlation uh, function, if there are any peaks, it tells us there's a signal there. It may be invisible to the naked eye when you look at the data things, but it's there. But then you can work harder and pull it out. So the answer is your question is we don't know, but we're going to be ready for anything. Having been a volunteer member of, uh, of SETI at home since probably the first day of its alpha testing, any idea how many MIPS have been volunteered to that project over the few years that it's been going, many years it's been going? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I know the answer exists, but nobody's ever happened to tell me how many it is. But it's a lot. There, there are millions of users of SETI at home, and any one of them is delivering probably a, a MIP. Uh, in their reports, so it, it's probably tetrabits, if that's a word. I don't know. Yeah, I was listening to a late night radio show or podcast or something where somebody was making a claim about they received a burst of intelligence from some place. Is that all a hoax, or was there something to that? Uh, it's not a hoax. We ha we are receiving bursts of radio emission, not only at telescopes like this, but at all the radio telescopes. It's a phenomenon, phenomenon called. FRBs, we call them, fast radio bursts. They seem to be coming from deep in the universe. They last a fraction of a second. Uh, but almost certainly they're not of intelligent origin because they're uh, across a very broad spectrum. It's not the sort of thing a regular transmitter would do. Uh, but also when we look at them with t high time resolution, we don't see any structure in them. So it doesn't look as though there's any information uh, uh, Add on them. There's no modulation. So <clears throat> we believe these are of natural origin, but it did give rise to the sort of report you just repeated because it's kind of fun to pretend they're of uh, extraterrestrial intelligent origin. So, what is the structure of the organization? <laughs> the structure of, et cetera. Of structure of uh, Great Breakthrough. Uh, it's very simple structure. There is uh, a president who is Yuri Milner, who's to be lauded for what he has done. Uh, he's committed a hundred million dollars to this project. Uh, he's also got another project called Breakthrough Message, which I'm one of the co-leaders of, which is to construct a message the best possible message you might send to extraterrestrials, although we're not going to send it. It's just an exercise, in part to answer the last question, what should we be looking for? Because the extraterrestrials might be sending something like what the best message is. Uh, and uh, there's a million dollar prize. It'll be announced soon. Anybody can apply. And I'm sure we're going to get 10,000 of, of uh, 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 submissions of possible messages, and it's going to be quite a lot of work to deal with them. But anyway, uh, Yuri Milner is the president. He's also the main contributor. And it's a private organization. It has essentially no other people involved except the managers of the various projects. The manager of Breakthrough Listen is Peter Warden, who is the ex-director of the NASA Ames Research Center. Uh, of uh, a breakthrough message is myself and Andrew Yan, who is a colleague and wife of Carl Sagan's. Uh, and he's got other things in mind, but nothing yet established. But there is no grand <laughs> operation. There is an accounting office that uh, takes care of the money side of things, but that's all there is. It's all nonprofit, by the way. <laughs> oh, there are thousands. <laughs> there are thousands of stars who have received "I Love Lucy" by now. 
But that's not enough. <laughs> maybe, maybe somebody's received it by now. I'll say, this is black and white. We're in color. This is an old society. <laughs> we sent a message in 1974 to the great globular cluster in Hercules from Arecibo, uh, <clears throat> which, uh, will, which is 300,000 stars, although the beam is so small it doesn't hit all of them. Uh, but in 25,000 years, there are going to be 100,000 stars or so who will get that message. So maybe 25,000 years later, we'll get an answer. <laughs> How does what you're doing fit into the theories of uh, quantum physics? The, the things we are doing have no connection with quantum physics at this point. Now, there's, there are theories of quantum entanglement producing the possibility of very quick communication. But this is unverified, and, and in any case, we have no way of uh, making observations relevant to that possibility. P Professor Drake, you want to make a couple of comments about the Drake equation? <laughs> yes, there is an equation called that. <laughs> which is a very simple equation. It has seven factors in it. It's actually a, the product of seven numbers, which simply describe the history of life, including intelligent life, on Earth. And we think it's a history that will apply equally well to other planets, which is why it's a nice, a good equation. It uh, says, well, the number of places that's out there, that are out there to be found is equal to the product of the rate of star formation. More stars, more planets. Uh, the number of, the fraction of those stars which actually have planets, which we now know is about 100%. That's one of the things we actually know well. Uh, and with, the, with that 100% of the stars which have planets, how many are habitable? Close enough to the, their star that the, well, at such a distance from the star that the conditions are right for life, which by our limited understanding means you need to have liquid water. So it has to be, the temperatures have to be above freezing but below boiling. So they have to be at the right distance from a star that the, you can swim. <laughs> no ice skating allowed, <laughs> uh, no boiling of eggs allowed, uh, except with <coughs> the proper stove. Then uh, what fraction of those actually give rise to life? Uh, there the evidence is very strong that any such planet will give rise to life given sufficient time. What fraction then of the life-bearing planets will give rise to intelligent life. That's one that's more problematical. Our fossil record shows that uh, the brain did evolve, and it evolved very fast once it got started, and that suggests that intelligence is very common, although there are people who argue that maybe that was a freakish event. So what fraction of intelligent civilizations develops technology? There are the pictures very clear that has Technology has been invented about five times separately on the Earth, at least. Technology is good for you until you get up to where you're making atomic bombs, perhaps. But up until that time, it's very beneficial. You can live in places that are otherwise uninhabitable. You can grow crops, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> put all those together, and you get the rate of production of technology, technologically bearing civilizations which we can detect. Uh, that comes out to be very roughly about one per year, which is a pretty heady figure. One new intelligent world per year in our galaxy. Then how many are there to detect? And here it gets very interesting and heady. Uh, what can you detect? Well, radio signals, optical flashes. Uh, our radio signals have been detectable for 100 years. What's our future history going to be? You have to invent the history of the future, which is a very uh, daunting, not only daunting, but dangerous and ridiculous thing to do almost. Uh, what's happening with us? Well, we've been detectable for 100 years, and what do we see now? Well, maybe the prospects aren't so good. Uh, the, the strength of our commercial radio signals is decreasing. And that's because the technology is getting better. But also, um, the strongest sign of our existence for years has been our television broadcasts. And what's happening? We're going digital. 
We're going to cable TV, which of course releases nothing into space. We're going to satellite transmission to the Earth, which I think is inevitably going to take over all of that. And typical satellite transmission to Earth is much fainter than traditional TV. Traditional TV transmitters have about a one million watt transmitter, spraying radiation in all directions. The signals from spacecraft to Earth are about 20 watts. 20 watts, most people don't know that, just to those little dishes people use. So if everybody goes to that route, Earth will become almost invisible. And uh, that could happen in 100 years, so maybe the length of the typical lifetime is 200 years. In that case, there are very few places where we, will, we can discover. On the other hand, if something keeps us bright for a billion years, which is also possible if we're using power stations in space, which transmit energy to Earth on microwaves, uh, then there's many places to detect. Uh, also, there will always be lights of cities at night. So if you can construct a telescope which can detect the lights of cities at night, then it will be quite easy to detect other civilizations because there will be many, many that are detectable. Well, can we do that? We know what it takes. It takes an optical telescope a few miles in diameter. Now, we can't do that right now, but uh, in principle, you could do it. It takes a lot of money. And also, there is a thing that is tantalizing, which we think about, which is that we can use our sun as a gravitational lens. We know it is a lens. It focuses light. Unfortunately, the focal point is 450 astronomical units from the Earth. So you have to get a spacecraft out to 450 AUs, and you can use our sun as a lens, and that is a powerful lens. You know, it's got an area equal to the size of the sun, and it easily detects the lights of cities at night. And so many of us, including me, suspect that this is the standard way civilizations are found. Civilizations know what I just told you, and they put the detectors out at 450 AUs, and they can find cities all over the galaxy. And in fact, you can also transmit to them with very little amount of light. So maybe that's what's done. And uh, our hang up there is that we don't send anything to 450 AUs, although we could do that too. It just takes a long time. But the Europeans have that on their agenda, to send a spacecraft to 450 AUs and look back at the sun and see if they detect anything. So that's kind of a long answer to your question, but it's interesting stuff. <laughs> Okay, um, we're going to take a fast five-minute break and get back on track. I, I've got to load some slides. Professor Drake, thank you so much for this presentation. Thank you.